ever to be allowed to represent Corvette on a given day. There is no one, no one better than Dr. Doug Keehan. He, when he gets here, he is going to be the greatest speaker we've had all day. He's here. I want to introduce to you, seriously, Dr. Doug Feehan, the number one Corvette man in all the world. Thank you. Thank you. Let me see that show of hands if you've listened to me before. Can you hear me now? Better? Show of hands of those that have listened to me before. See, that kind of bums me out. Because now i got to think of some brand new stuff. I can't use the old stuff. Can you hear me in the back there? We're good? I see a raise of hands, that means good. Okay. This is a uh, formidable crowd. Who is here on uh, Wednesday and Thursday? <laughs> yeah, God bless you. It was musical. It didn't stop raining. It was cold. It was nasty. We persevered through a couple practice sessions. We likely had to qualify in the rain. But all along it said weather was going to be good today. It's going to be great tomorrow on Sunday. And that's really what it's all about. If we can get good weather on race day, I think we're going to have a great show. This is a, 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 I'm not sure this might be, and I've checked with Angie, this could be our biggest crowd here ever. I mean, last year was huge, but this is awesome. I love it. Who traveled the furthest to get here in their car? What do you got? New Jersey. New Jersey. Oh, yeah, Mom says, wait a minute, she came from Maine. Oh, you guys aren't living together anymore? I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> Sometimes that works out best as long as you got two Corvettes in the family. What do we got back here? Connecticut. Well, we'd have to look at Speedos there, although Connecticut might get it done. Anybody further than Connecticut? I flew down. I'm from Detroit. All right. I know we got a lot of questions. I'm sure we have a lot of questions out there about what's going on this year. I'll give you a little background. We spent what little off-season we had, right? working out and developing the cars we normally do. This year, new to the program, not our program, but the IMSA race program, is the fact that the GTD category, all right, has been expanded to accept versions of the European GT3 category. Are we tuned into that? All right, I don't want to get too deep in it because if not, everybody follows it as closely as that. But in Europe, the GT3 cars are configured, they're actually faster than the GT Le Mans cars. Because the GT3 series has no rules. You bring whatever you want, and then they quote unquote balance it over there. So in order to offset that, <clears throat> and to be able to keep the performance division between the GT Le Mans class and the GTD class wide enough, so the GTD guys aren't getting in our way, we've all, every manufacturer, have received some aero package developments that we were allowed to implement on the cars. For Corvette, we have a new front splitter, which is deeper and wider and more effective, obviously giving us more front downforce. And to equalize that, in the back, we have a new rear wing, which is set further back, which gives us a little greater moment, a little greater leverage. So when you add those two things together, the car is going to press down on the racetrack a lot harder, going to allow us to corner faster, and it allows us to brake better. In addition, you'll see the side skirts, the lower below the door, those little sills that come out, those are wider as well. Those help downforce and reduce drag. In addition to that, we have a new rear diffuser, which is about 25% bigger than our old diffuser. And what that does is, that allows the air to be speeded out from under the car. What we're trying to create in the vehicle, essentially, is an upside down airplane wing. All right? We want, the faster we go, we want that car to fly harder into the racetrack. And you can figure out why, because you can corner better and brake better. All right? So that the rear diffuser that you see under there with those strakes in it is designed to speed the air out under the car at a faster rate than the air traveling over the top of the car. And that, in turn, reduces the pressure under it, the air going over the top presses down on it, and we increase overall downforce. Generally speaking, downforce is not that difficult to achieve. What is difficult to achieve is avoiding the penalty you pay in drag. 
In other words, if you tip your wing up higher and you do a bunch of other things to get the car to press down, it takes more horsepower to push it through the wind. And when you do that, you slow the car down. There are ways and there are methods to implement all those things I just talked about and not only keep drag the same, but also reduce drag. That is the whole package that our guys have been working on all winter. And when you get down there and see the cars, if you haven't already seen them, you'll notice, on glance, at first glance, you might not notice anything. But when you look at them carefully, you'll see each one of those individual things that I pointed out. It'll be very obvious to you what the differences are. So, now, the reality is the other guys pretty much got the same thing. So, now we're thinking we're going to be right back where we were last year, running at the back. What happened over the winter was, and, and I don't want to give you guys too much credit, but the sanctioning body had themselves a little epiphany and figured out that the differential of performance between the cars running at the back, us, and the cars running at the front, normally Porsche, was just something that was far too great not to be dealt with. Your guys' efforts, Charlie's not here, Charlie Robertson, you know, Charlie, she's kind of like the leader of the informational pack. Her freezer broke this morning, so she had to get her freezer replaced. She's on her way now. But anyway, she led that email brigade, and you guys responded. You wrote emails to the sanctioned body, you wrote emails to Scott Athen, and you wrote emails to, I don't know who the hell you wrote emails to, but it had an effect. It truly did. They have put together a brand new methodology on which to base balance of performance, up to and including, per our suggestion and leadership in the manufacturer's meetings, we wanted to see every one of the competitors bring their car to a wind tunnel facility that we use, GM facility, it's called Wind Shear, it's down in North Carolina, and they did that. And they put each one of the cars in last year's configuration in the wind tunnel, and then had you update it, bring your parts, and update it to what this year's configuration was going to be, with all the new stuff. When they did that, they found out the guys that were blowing smoke up their skirt. Okay? First and foremost, Porsche. They found out how much downforce they had given Porsche without them realizing they had done it. We have new data recorders in the car that they supply. We spent, I don't know what it was, I think it's 18,000 bucks a car, all right, to put this new data recorder in that looks at a whole bunch of stuff that they never looked at before. It's almost impossible now, difficult, not impossible, but almost impossible to game the system. We came down for the roar, everybody ran around. Of all the data submitted, we had to submit power curves for our engine. They knew what our aero package was. They put those two things together. They can, through computer simulation, determine what our lap ought to be. And look at all the data. They know what's going on inside the cars now. We, after the roar, were the closest manufacturer to performing as they had predicted, as per the data we had submitted. We were pretty much spot on. The rest of them weren't even close. They looked at, put up a curve. We had a meeting here at the beginning of the week. And they put up the performance curves, curves of this racetrack. Complete lap of the racetrack, what each individual car was doing and where they were doing it. And it was clear to see on these curves that A, one competitor, for um, was coming out of the bus stop and shifting from first to third, so the car would not accelerate too greatly on the racetrack. They also would come down through NASCAR 4 and lift, so the car would slow down. All of this in an effort to, to record a lower lap time than what they were actually capable of, of, of doing. And every manufacturer was doing similar things to that lifting and, and, and not running at full throttle. But all this showed up in this curve. And we're all sitting in the meeting, it took about, and, and the curves that came up were not identified. But all sitting in the meeting, it took us about five seconds to recognize our own individual curve, right? The Ford guys knew what they were doing and they could see their curve. Porsche guys knew what they were doing, Ferrari guys knew what they were doing, BMW guys knew what they were doing. So after we were the good guys there, well, we got our restrictor reduced by two tenths of a millimeter. 
because we were pretty fast. Porsche didn't have a whole lot done to them. All the turbo cars got changed. But the turbo cars don't run a restrictor. They run an electronic control that varies the amount of boost according to the RPM. And what that does is it allows you to put together a power curve of a turbo car that closer resembles a naturally aspirated car. That's a big step forward. I think that's going to work really, really well. Well, all in all, all said and done, they put all the data together, they announced the final BOP, which is what we're running now. This morning was the first time cars had run on a dry track, so who knows how close they're really going to be, the race will tell. But from everything we've seen, we're pretty confident it's going to be a lot closer than it was last year, and we're also very confident that the year goes on, that they're going to bring, bring if there is a discrepancy, they're going to be able to bring that down. I think we're going to get a lot better racing this year. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. They have promised that meddling from above with the data and, and making subject, subjective changes rather than data-driven changes isn't going to happen. Uh, the people that I know and speak with inside the organization indicated that this balance performance was not meddled with, that it was purely data-driven. So we'll see. It's going to be fun. We're actually excited right now because we think it's going to be a lot better. And, and by the way, you don't have to be the fastest to win here. You just have to spend the fewest minutes in the pits which we've done here successfully once or twice before. So that's the status of where we are right now. I know that is probably going to answer some of the questions you guys have. But uh, let's see what else you got and see if we can, we can get it figured out. You know that if I don't know the answer, I'll make one up so good you won't know the difference. <laughs> Anybody? Where do you want to start? Yes, sir. The, the question is, those that attended the roar, notice we were working on that new side skirt around the exhaust area. The, the issue was because that skirt sticks out further now, flat part out from under the door where that exhaust comes out, we like to keep that exhaust tucked in close to the bodywork so it doesn't interfere with the airflow over that skirt. But in doing so, we have a stainless steel protective sheet that protects that carbon fiber. And quite frankly, just underestimating what the temperature was going to be running on the high bank and whatever, that exhaust was heating up that carbon fiber, causing an issue. And we ended up extending that, building some pieces on there. We've got new pieces on there now, so it shouldn't be a problem. But that's kind of like why you go test. And Daytona does produce uh, different results than other racetracks do. So, uh, you know, wasn't that, wasn't that big a deal? We anticipated that we'd have things like that, and uh, we were able to get that settled down. But that was it. Yes, sir. The, the question is, why wouldn't we use aluminum rather than stainless steel? Because <clears throat> aluminum has a, a higher dissipation rate of the heat, which is very true, except that it rests right on the carbon, so that heat dissipation gets transferred through that carbon much more quickly through aluminum than it does through stainless. And the stainless, aluminum melts, I think, at 1100 degrees Fahrenheit, 11 or 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. That exhaust gas is pretty hot. Uh, that level of the deterioration, that risk of deterioration of that material, stainless is pretty much impervious to all that, and that's why we use, that's why we use the stainless. It's, it's not so much as trying to disperse the heat as it is to redirect the heat without it causing a problem. So that was the reason for the selection of that material. Yes, sir. What was the, uh, the reasoning behind moving the pitot tubes from the roof of the car to the front of the car? For those of you who don't know, on the front of the car, you see these two little aluminum tubes, 90 degree bends in them, kind of sticking out like little tiny antlers or something. Engineers, that's the guy. They would be the death of the so about, you know, beginning of the year last year, they decided they need a pitot tube. What a pitot tube does, it, it's a tiny little pinhole in it. You run through the air, the air blows in, it's hooked to a device that tells you how fast you're going, your true and honest airspeed, so to speak. And they use that in their calculations. It is a val valuable measurement. I'm not sure during the race that it matters so much, but if you're going to use it at all on the racetrack, it has to be homologated into the race car via the FIA. So you can't have something on there during practice and take it off and not use it during the race. It's got to be the same. The reason we have two is so there's redundancy. So when the first one gets plugged up, you got another one that you might be able to go to. 
I, you know, that's it's 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 how we do it. But that's why they're why are they there rather than on the roof? Because we got so much antenna and camera stuff on the roof that it just fits better where it is on the nose, and it creates less of an aero disturbance there as well. It's easier to service there. It, you know, it's connected to our data recorder. It's a shorter run. It just you know, it's just some very basic common sense reasons why we put it on the front. It's kind of an odd looking piece. I, I, I've gotten used to it. I pretend I don't see it. Pardon? That <laughs> probably won't be available from the fact. I'm not sure that's a bad thing. Okay? Don't, don't, don't bring it up. <laughs> yes, sir? Doug, uh, there's some discussion that you were sending a message by adding a little of America out there. <laughs> The, the question is noticing, you know, each year with the C7, we've just played, we like that basic graphic because it's simple, all right? It's easy to maintain, doesn't take away from the lines of the car. It's pretty cool, understated, all the things we like it to be. But each year we change it up a little bit. You know, we had a flat gray, then we had a glossy gray, then we had a chrome. And this year we've changed it. If you look closely at it, you could think it was kind of a stars and stripes thing, you know, going on there. And uh, in the real small letters at the bottom of it, it says, Made in America. Yeah. How about that? Because, by the way, <laughs> by the way, each and every one of the competitors, they're gonna be racing against us tomorrow. None of them can say that. But none of them are made in America. Not the Ford, not the BMW, not the Ferrari not the Porsche. They're all made in another country. I just thought, in my own little twisted way, that with all the media that the Ford is getting, okay, Big Blue, Return to the Mall, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> how about we make it in America, dude? And that's what we do. From Bowling Green, Kentucky to Detroit, Michigan, baby. Made in America. And oddly enough, I actually got management to buy off on it. I had, I had very low expectation based on my previous experience with things like this, but I developed a little communication path, you know, starting at the bottom and working my way up. And we had enough momentum by the time we got to the top, everybody had bought in, and so it makes it really hard. When you got 10 guys who were saying yes, and it gets the 11th guy, he doesn't want to be the guy that says, I don't think this is a good idea. So we made it happen. They love it. They embraced it. I'm pretty proud to have it. I know the guys on the team are proud to have it. And I know it makes you guys proud that we got it on there. And uh, it was just done in, in, in just kind of a subtle, understated way, just like we like to operate. So I was pretty thrilled we got that done. Thank you for noticing, Jen. Appreciate that. Yes, sir? Where is the C8R? Pardon me? C8R. C8? Eight. Eight. About six o'clock, food will be here. We haven't eaten yet. You haven't missed a thing. You'll see somebody up there eating and be just fine. Oh, you mean the, the next generation Corvette? I think they're working on that right now. I've been told they have, and uh, they're pretty excited about it. And they're excited about it because they think when you see it, you'll be excited about it. So, probably be a ways off yet. I, I, I wouldn't wait for it if I were you, judging the average age of the community in here. I'd be buying my time. <laughs> in that. Okay? I'm just saying, don't wait. Buy it. Buy it. Enjoy a new one while you can. There'll be another new one coming. All right? And, 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 I can, and, I, and I'll share this with you without probably being sent to prison. From a performance standpoint, we're not taking any steps backwards, guys. All right? We're not moving backwards. We're going to get better every time. Cool. Yes, sir? Why a mid-engine? Pardon me? Why a mid-engine? I have I, I couldn't tell you with any degree of certainty what the engine position is okay. going to be, nor can I tell you what that engine configuration is going to be. I don't know whether it's going to be a V8 like we run now. I don't know if it's going to be a V6, a twin-turbo V6, a, a supercharged four-cylinder, because I don't know that those decisions have actually been made in-house. You know, a GM, you should know this. Although I think, you know, by a couple hundred thousand units, I think we're second or third largest automobile manufacturer in the world. I think Toyota 
finished first by 100,000, and then I think Volkswagen, which owns a bunch of different stuff, not just Beatles, uh, was there 100,000 behind, and I think we're in third place at General Motors. There's nobody, nobody in any manufacturing facility, <clears throat> any motor manufacturer, that has more advanced engines com designed, completed, and capable of running, sitting on a shelf ready to plug in a vehicle than General Motors. They are the most advanced engine designer, <laughs> engine builders in the world, bar none, period. And, and those guys could be sitting right here in the audience from the other manufacturers and they would not be able to get up and deny what I just told you. And by the way, our diesel's illegal. <laughs> just, just saying. A new little four-cylinder in our Colorado truck. It's all world, baby. I drove one the other day, and it is just awesome. You know, this trend, it's just a very good point you bring up, because this transition, I had a conversation a number of years ago, three, four years ago, with a Corvette owner, and he says, God, I hope, I hope the hell we're not putting some V6 in the Corvette. I said, well, why do you say that? Well, we got, we got stayed with V8. I said, well, okay, how much is your V8 making? He says, well, it makes, uh, Z06 makes, you know, uh, 505 horsepower. I said, well, what if I told you we're putting in a twin turbo V6 that made 800 horsepower? Well, I, I, I'd like that. Well, I thought you said you know on V6. <laughs> well, I just meant, no, I, what you meant was it's old school. You tend to think of small displacement engines as not being efficient or powerful. The reality of it is, that's where we're going, all right? When you look at what a tie, what that engine in the ATSV, anybody seen that little deal? Dude, you could almost put it in your pocket. Right? And that thing can develop 700 horsepower all day long. It doesn't do it in that race car because of the way they have it restricted. But small displacement boosted motors, lightweight, tiny, package nice, and they make huge power all day long. So. Who would have thought? I, I think you can buy. I mean, you can buy a big pickup truck. I think you can buy an Impala with a four-cylinder motor in it right now. Yeah, I had one. I had one the other day. I drove it. Now it wasn't. I, I drive a high-powered car at home, but I drove it. it. It was fine. I'm thinking, well, this must be V6. I should get to where I'm going. I look at the hood. It was a four-cylinder in there. I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. I would have never known it if it wasn't the case. So we got to get away from this thinking that number of cylinders equates to power, because it doesn't. And that's what gives us so much opportunity in any new vehicles that we're building, a wide array of stuff that we don't have. Our V8 package is tiny. I mean, it's really small and produces huge power. And that's recognized globally. It's inexpensive to build, it gets huge economy. You know that in the cars you drive, it's a great package. But as the world goes forward and there's gonna be greater, greater requirements to get an outstanding fuel economy, you have to look other places to go without sacrificing performance. Getting back to what started this conversation, we're not going backwards. Regardless of what's in there, your foot and your fanny are going to feel it when you press it. Yes, sir. The two new drivers, you know, they're going to be up here in a little bit, those two boys. If you follow Corvette Racing for a while, we have two new drivers here for this event and for Sebring. Marcel Fossler, who has been with us before, raced with Corvette Racing once before for these endurance races. It wasn't Daytona, but <clears throat> the other uh, endurance races that we have ridden in the back of what was American Le Mans series. And a new guy, Mike Rockefeller, or as he's affectionately known, Rocky, and I'll introduce him when they get here. Both of those guys are factory Audi drivers. Both of those guys have won them all countless times. Both of those guys have tremendous record of championships. Both of those guys have been after me for a long time to drive in the Corvette, although they're full-time employees of Audi. We're very fortunate, just because I'm part of this aged Corvette group, having done this for a long time, I have a very good personal relationship with Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich, who runs Audi Motorsports globally. He's a great guy, he's a good friend of mine. German, obviously, and I don't know why, but he likes beer. <laughs> I'm not saying that's a common bond, I'm just saying he likes beer. And throughout the years, we've developed a good working relationship. And uh, in a conversation, we talked about Daytona this year, talked about his guys. Uh, I told him, you know, you guys really want to do this. He says, they've been bugging the hell out of me. And he says, can we work something out? I said, yeah, we can. And so he was kind enough to give us his two guys for this event and for Sebring. And we are going to be the benefactors for that. Those guys are great guys. And, and you'll meet them, you'll find them. 
You, you know me and drivers. I mean, going fast is one thing. That's only half the battle. The other battle is recognizing how important a role they play in your lives and how they have to assimilate to our Corvette way of doing business with drivers. How they have to be outgoing, friendly, accommodating. And these guys are all of that and more. These guys could be full-time Corvette drivers in a heartbeat. And I have to tell you, they've been grinning ear to ear since we've been here. They appreciate being here. They know they have the absolute best chance ever. Keep in mind, winning the 24 hours at Daytona is every race driver's goal. Not just because they get a free watch, okay? <laughs> Although that's how the terms they put it in. It's, it's the prestige and the difficulty of winning this event. It's the American version of Le Mans. And so they want to be here. And they don't want to be here with just any chump team just driving around and have somebody pay them. They want to be with a team that they think gives them the best chance to win. And that's why they're here. They're great guys. You'll meet them, you'll like them. Yes, sir. So when those yellow Corvettes go by on the track, you don't start by with your eyes closed. If you go down that six, the, the, the question is, as, as the big ground pound and American Thunder V8s run by on this racetrack, with your eyes closed, you can tell it's the Corvette. What's going to happen if we ever were to go to the V6 turbocharger? Start with, you'd actually have to open your eyes. Okay? Could be a challenge for some. But you, look, you look capable. Right, and, and secondly, you'd have to reserve your seat at, at the victory podium because when we're standing on top there, you're going to want down there cheering, yelling, and screaming. Then you'll forget all about that little whine that it might make. It does make a different noise. It does make a different noise. Again, this gets down to the old school, new old school. You know, it'll still be. Uh, it's still. I mean, I've spent some time on that Cadillac like ATSV program, dude. It's still plenty loud enough. <laughs> Just a little different. I don't know. This year, if you notice, we are a different sound than we were last year. We have a different exhaust system on the car, and quite frankly, it's deeper and louder than it was last year, just by the virtue of its length. So there's a lot of that fine tuning goes on. We do it for power. So if a smaller displacing engine comes and it's boosted, yeah, I think it pretty much depends. But well, just talking about the girl and she's here. Uh, you don't look any chillier. Did you get your freezer? Brand new refrigerator, look at that girl smile. And still made it in time for the Corvette crowd. Jim's in prison, I understand. Yep. <laughs> Bail him out afterwards, his four speeding tickets caught up with him. I'm glad you're here. Anyway, we'll get used to it, if it happens. I, again, I'm being straight up with you. I don't know what's going in there. I, I don't know. We'll have to wait and find out. I'm excited either way, because I know it's going to be more power than what we got. Anything else? Yes. Do we think IMSA might in engineer a finish like they did last year? <laughs> you know, IMSA is code for NASCAR. If they engineer it and it turns out exactly like last year, dude, I'm for it. Get engineering right now. I'm signing up. I don't know. I don't know. They, uh, they may. It's unusual that those things are that close. I've had, quite frankly, this is pretty amazing. I've been part of the three closest finishes of the Daytona 24 hours. One, two, and three. Right? First was back in 19, what would it have been? 1991, all right, when we won by, I don't know what it was, 62 seconds, something like that. In 96, I had the Aurora WSC program, we won by a minute, and last year we won by .485, something like that. It's pretty crazy, those, those three. We, we lost in 2000. 2000, we lost by 32 seconds, I think, to the Viper. So those close finishes are pretty cool. They don't happen that often. But we're prepared for them, if they do. Yes, sir. The question is, for Lamar this coming year, do we think we'll be as competitive as we were last year? The answer is yes. I, I neglected to mention, just an oversight on my part, in the beginning when I talked about the creation of this new balance of performance, the ACO and the FIA along with IMSA are collaborating on information sharing 
IMSA is taking lessons learned and direction from the ACO to help develop their BOP. That's why I have confidence it's going to be better. So it should be very, very, should be very, very close just like it was last year. I don't look forward to be any different. If anything, probably a little bit closer, which could be good or bad. But you know, I mean, we need a little, we need a little bit more performance, and they gave it to us this year and pulled some of it back from the other guys. But those are all new cars. BM, well, BMW won't be there, but the Ferrari's a brand new car, and uh, the Porsche is a similar car, and uh, who else we got going on there? Ferrari is a, is a Ferrari and Porsche. For, Ferrari and Ford are brand new cars, so their performance levels are gonna be pretty high, but they're gonna, they're at Le Mans, they're watching what we're doing here. Le Mans's gonna look at the data that goes on here to help them guide their Le Mans balance and performance. That's a good thing. You get more people, you know, it's, it's tough, tougher to be subversive when you have more people sitting in the room. And Le Mans is very, very serious about it. You've seen that in the races at Le Mans. They do a wonderful job of BOP. So that's, that's gonna be a good thing for these guys. These guys are gonna be happy that they hooked up with them. That was, by the way, encouraged by all the manufacturers as well. So that's a good question, I missed that point. Yes. Yes. Is it, the question is, we've got 94, well, I, we know 94 or 92? 92. 92. We have 92 liters of fuel and, and thought the rule was that it was just a, a, a 90 liter tank. I have to, you know, I, I, I'm going to plead honesty here and say I don't know what the new FIA, because they just released the brand new rules a couple weeks ago. So I don't know what the max capacity is. By the way, I think the BMW is running 104 liters, and I think the Ferrari is running 78. I know that, but but but, but we are. I don't, I don't, I, not, I know I don't have an answer because I, I don't know what the new capacity is. It used to be 100, then they dropped it down to like 96. So I don't know what we're going to do there. It'll it'll be equivalent. I'm not worried about it. They do they they do a great job of figuring that stuff out. But that's something to think about, talking about fuel capacity. You know, every, every car has a different fuel capacity. How do you explain the difference? The BMW is carrying 104 liters of fuel. The Ferrari is carrying 78 liters. That's what, 22, 23%? Mad, somewhere in there. And they're both like 4.5 liter V8 engines, producing the same, supposedly the same amount of power. That seems like a huge discrepancy. I mean, if I'm Ferrari, I'm thinking, what's going on? The reality of it is, or so they say, uh, that BMW, the, their con engine configuration is utilizing the extra fuel uh, to help cool the engine, which is which is a basic tenant of turbocharging. In some engines, that's what they do do. Uh, Ferrari rear engine, they've got it figured out, their engine's able to run cooler for some reason, who knows why, rear engine versus front engine, I mean, I, I don't know. This race will portend the, the validity of that, but they have some very, very, very good data on fuel usage from the roar, and it, it substantiates what they're telling us. So, I mean, if they're able to run, if we're able to run, you know, 15 laps and they're able to run 22, <laughs> that engine cooling thing's pretty much out the window. But uh, I, I, I think it's legit. We'll find out here now, though. And then uh, I'll have to find out what's going on with Lamar. I'll, I'll let you know. Because in all, in all likelihood, they're either going to give us that capacity or, or they'll reduce everybody accordingly, which could be. They don't like cars in the pit lane a lot. Fewer pit stops are better, safer, quicker. So we'll see what they do. Good question. In the back. We know the driver lineup who's starting. Uh, no, I don't. Where, where we qualified? You know, I barely know that. I think we qualified seventh and eighth. Is that correct? Yes. Anybody watch that? When I was down there doing other stuff. Yeah, I think seventh and eighth, which is in a 24-hour race, for the most part, last year aside. Uh, you know, that means you're starting about 128 feet behind. So if you can't make up 128 feet in 24 hours, you're gonna put it on a trailer and take it home. In the rain, it makes absolutely no sense to run these cars full tilt 
and try and achieve some sort of lap time. There's no upside to it. We knew the Porsche was going to be the fastest anyway because the rear engine cars are always the fastest in the rain. So the difference of qualifying third and fourth and seventh and eighth is we got cars, we brought them back, they were in one piece, we didn't break anything, we didn't blow anything up, we were happy that happened. So that, there you go. And by the way, I think the Porsches, actually the first six or seven cars in GTLM are the fastest cars in the field. Now I don't know what they're going to do yet, but we'll find out tomorrow at the driver's meeting as far as starting order. My guess would be they would still group the LMP cars at the front. I wouldn't be a big fan of the, the GT cars starting and leading and having to get run over by all those guys the race goes on. And so I'm hoping that they divvy them back up and we start back in the GT position in the order in which we qualify. So that's a interesting, it doesn't happen very often, but the rain, rain causes that. We'll do one more question. Is that a question or some type of camera signal? It's a question. Okay. When you did qualifying yesterday, were you on wet Michelins or slicks? When we qualified yesterday, we were on wets. So do you start with wets tomorrow then? No, no, no. The provision in the rules that, that when you qualify on, on a rain and the race is dry, I mean, you could if you wanted to, um, but no, they, they allow you to change okay. that. All right, I see our guys are here. Are they all here? All right, where's Michael? You got anything for me? Okay, thank you. All right, let's go through introductions. Well, look at Ian, he's looking down. What, is it something for me? Huh? You got something like more free shit? Number one on our list. From Denmark. Guy's been here for a while. We don't talk about years here because I like it some um, Jan Magnuson. He's got half of Denmark here with him for this race. I saw it today. Yeah. Can I talk about this other thing? That answer's no. I'll take it for an answer. Thank you. All right. Stay tuned. Exciting news in the Magnuson family. How's that? And no, his wife's not pregnant. Not that he's aware of. Second line. You know my favorite guy, hailing from Spain. They're still in business over there, aren't they? Yes, which one? Said he couldn't get here soon enough. No telling what the hell's going on there now. Antonio Garcia. Those are my guys. New addition. Rocky, you weren't here while I was talking about you. You know? Look at him. We've known each other for a while. And as you heard me say, a welcome addition of German descent, but a guy who has raced extensively throughout the world, including America, has spent some time at Chevrolet running prototypes for us. But here at Corvette, Mike Rockenfeller, welcome aboard, buddy. And in the middle, our guy, our anchor, and I don't mean that because he's slow, I mean that because he has the most experience on this team, he spent the most time with you guys, and, and regretfully for him, he's had to spend the most time with me. Okay, Oliver Gavin. And our little snow bunny from Virginia. Okay, we had to give himself a little snow shovel to dig his way out. Yeah. His girlfriend helped him, okay? Yeah, oh yeah. If she was my girlfriend, I'd be shoveling real slow. <laughs> number one, because I want to save the energy, but number two, I just want to watch her do it. <laughs> Tommy Milner. And last but not certainly least, returning to Corvette for another championship assault, although interestingly enough, this is a guy, how many times you won them all? Four or five times? Three? Close enough. <laughs> won them all four or five times. <laughs> and has never been to Daytona. <laughs> but, as I said before, on his bucket list. So here he is for his inaugural trip. He might as well do it in a quarterback, Marcel Fox. So 
come on close here. You've heard enough of me. They're going to run a little autograph session here. They'll bring some stuff up. They'll do it. But one of you guys asked me for something today. It might have been Marcel. Did you not? Marcel asked me for something today. He signed a bunch of these for something we're doing here, okay? And, and they didn't have any for the drivers. And so he kind of, yeah, I know. What are they thinking, Michael? <laughs> so at any rate, seeing that, I thought, you know what? might be nice if we, while we're doing our little autograph thing, new guys, you know, they haven't been around much, and they really love the family, and I want you guys to love them. I thought it'd be nice to give both Marcel and Rocky their official Corvette racing hats. <laughs> So it's official. I guess now, Mikey, what, they'll get in line, sign the stuff, and do the drill? Cool. Thank you all. We're going to give you a great race tomorrow. I appreciate the time.